We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question is, so what happened at SeanCon Spring 2023? Okay, I admit it. No one actually asked this question. But we do get requests often for more con coverage. Um, actually, we just had it the other day in our Discord. Someone came up and was asking about con coverage. So they were talking about Origins. And while Sean Con isn't Gen Con or PAX or Origins, it was us getting together, getting in a lot of gaming over three days, enough that it seemed like enough to talk about as a main segment instead of just tossing in our weekend and review at the end of the show. So while I was covering all the panels at Sean Con, Mo and Dee were at the tables. Uh, no. <laughs> yes. Now you may be asking yourself, wait a minute, I thought Sean lived in Windsor now, and Sean Con was a thing of the past. Well, we thought so too. See, the thing is, with Sean being down here in Windsor, it doesn't mean he has any less obligations. As he just mentioned in our lobby, yeah, it's extremely busy with work, and he still has obligations with his families and goes back up to Hamilton to visit his kids. Proximity alone really didn't turn into quite as much gaming time together as we expected. Now, we have sat at the table together more often, and he's made it out to some public events, but it's not like we're gaming together every week. Between work, family, and all too often illnesses, yeah. it just hasn't happened nearly as much as we expected when the move initially happened. Now, another thing I've noticed, which is something... I've also noticed with all public play events that I run is that when you can get together anytime, when there's a regular event, it's always happening. It becomes far too easy to say, nah, let's just do this later. Or no, we'll get to it next week. Or you know what? Let's put it off for another week. And while that putting off just happened, never happens. So the, the later never happens. Let's do this later. Yeah. And then later, maybe later and months go by. The thing is, it's really easy the way things are now to sit here on a Wednesday night, getting to the segment about what you got coming up and going, hey, we're going to play this and we're going to play that. And we got these five games on the obligation and we're going to knock the pile of shame down by 10. But then when the week rolls on, those game nights to actually play them just don't happen. Sadly enough, when you're too tired, you need to finish something up, you're not feeling great for one reason or another. Excuses are really easy to make. Yeah. So to combat both of these, I wanted to try something. I wanted to bring back our semi-regular Sean Cons. And by that, I mean setting aside an entire weekend to just hang out, game together, and enjoy each other's company and check out some of the local sites. Have Sean come over on a Friday night, stay overnight a couple nights, and not leave until Sunday morning, and pretty much put the work aside, except for some things that need to get done. And this way, I couldn't even oversleep or have car trouble. I was, in the best possible way, trapped. <laughs> and frankly, the couch there seems like a second or third home. I really quite sl sleep quite well there every time. Yeah, that's always nice to it. Now, to make this more of an event, in addition to gaming here at my place, I planned out an entire week of events. Most gaming related, but there was some time out and about as well, which of course involves some great local food. And my thought process was, I need this to feel special. Or again, it's just going to be far too easy to be like, oh, you know what? I know we we're going to play all weekend, but I, you know, I'm kind of tired. I'm going to head home. I'm like, let's make this a big deal so it feels special. One thing you'll always get if you spend a few days with Mo is a dining experience. <laughs> I am also known as the big dude who likes food. Indeed. Now, speaking of food, let's start with our first meal. Uh, unlike our normal game segment, this is about all of Sean Con, not just the game. So this started off with our first ever try of a place called Cranky Burner. Burger. Burner? Cranky Burner. No, Cranky Burger. Cranky Burger. This is a weird little place that happens to be on Jefferson and Tecumseh, which is pretty close to my house, that is in the back of an actual restaurant that's well known in the area. All of this there is this blue door. There's no sign for Cranky Burger whatsoever. And it's deliver and takeout only. This is the kind of place that started up because of COVID. It, they opened up a delivery-only DoorDash-based business, basically, and it's done well enough that they keep expanding. In the morning, it's a breakfast burrito place. Now at nights, it's a cranky burger, and it's also some kind of wing place. They're both using the same kitchen. Now, I heard about this place thanks to local social media. There is a smash burger place that we've all tried and we all enjoy called Wamburg. And every time I shared a picture of Wamberg, someone was like, oh, have you tried Cranky Burger yet? Oh, you got to try Cranky Burger. Oh, if you like Smash Burgers, you got to try Kink. Cranky Burger. So we did. I've been meaning to do it for a while. We each got burgers and sides. Um, we got three different types of burgers. I know mine had, um, what do you call it? Mine, mine had um, 
cheese curds on it and other stuff. Bacon, I think. Um, D, I don't even know. I think hers had mushroom and stuff. You had like the, the cheesy one. Yeah, I had the mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. So mac and cheese burger. And then we each got different sides. We wanted to try them. So there were tater tots. Um, I got onion rings. Deanna got waffle fries. And then we also ordered these like cheese fritters yeah. as, as a side dish. And mm-hmm. well, peanut butter cups. Yeah, I mean, the burger was fantastic. It had a great bun with that nice, crisp sort of, you know, egg wash coating on it. Um, the cheese sauce that went with the the mac and cheese really balanced out all the flavors fantastically. And it was it was a good, you know, smash style burger. What really shocked me, though, was the tater tots, because I was <laughs> fully expecting, you know, a bunch of, of McCain tater tots yep. that had been deep fried. And they weren't. They no. were not McCain tater fries. They were their own tater tots, and they had been really well seasoned. Like yeah. these were the best tater tots I have ever had, which sounds really weird to say, but it's true. Yeah. And the onion rings were good, but even better was some kind of southern barbecue sauce to dip them in. I don't know what, excuse me, I don't know what that sauce was, but it was fantastic. So we all enjoyed that, and we'll probably be ordering Cranky Burger again sometime. But on to the games. First up was a two-player game of Disney Sorcerer's Arena. And the goal with this game was to try out the expansion. So I grabbed the three characters from Thrills and Chills, which was Mother Gothel, the Horn King, and Jack Skellington. And Sean ended up grabbing the other, the most recent set leading the charge. Yeah, so I had uh, Buzz Lightyear, Scar, and Elsa. Now, just as a, a quick summary, I figure why not talk about each of these characters and what we thought of them, kind of as a short review leading up to our formal review, which might or might not be next week. <laughs> we'll see. Um, first off, Gothel, I love. Gothel was a ton of fun to play, mostly about doing nasty things to the opponents. Lots of cards that made the opponent banish cards. Cards that I was amused. He had a card that damaged all princesses in play. Of course, there were no princesses in play but that was one of the things um lots of stealth cards she had lots of ways to not get hit and big damage cards that required the stealth so i I really enjoyed playing mother gothel in disney sorcerer's arena well buzz lightyear was a real ranged powerhouse with the ability to do follow-up damage to opponents who had Mm -hmm. been hit as well as damage at multiple different ranges which usually players are either up close or ranged Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a very solid uh, utility character that would sort of like just easily fit into almost any group. And one thing I did notice with him is his best ability, though, was on his card. So I don't think he, he'd be as good without using the full level four rules. The right. chapter four rules. Next was the Horton King, which I wanted to love. The uh, Black Cauldron is actually one of my favorite Disney movies. And his character summons cauldron born, which are like undead coming out of the cauldron. And it added whole rules for minions, basically. It's not what they call them, but that's what I'd like to call them. They kind of they're tokens that act as characters. Had all kinds of awesome cards for moving these tokens and attacking with them. Problem is I couldn't get any in play. The only way to get them in play was to earn a crown. And I couldn't seem to get crowns and often enough to keep them in. And then when I put them in, they just got wiped out. So they were great when I had them. But then when I didn't, Almost every card in the Horn King's deck was based on these and useless otherwise. So this one, I just think I need a combo. I need something that earns me crowns without knocking people out, like some kind of quick way to get crowns to get these out right away so they don't just get wiped out. Yeah. So I also had Scar, and this was the first character I'd seen who, like uh, um, Gothel with the, you know, affects princesses, Scar Mm -hmm. affected on all the villain keywords that were out uh, in play. Uh, and the other handy thing was he could steal a victory point space out from under you. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, <laughs> when he was hogging the glory, the entire team suffered by not healing as much. Uh, so not surprisingly, Scar is a selfish character. Shocking. Yes. And that was part of my problem with the Horn King is every time I put him on a stupid victory spot, Scar would push me off and I didn't get my cauldron born. Um, next up, a uh, final one in the Thrills and Chills expansion is Jack Skellington, one of the cooler characters from Disney of all time. Uh, surprisingly, a tank, some of the highest health in the game, not the highest, but up there, like 10 health, 
and lots of cards that cause status effects. Now, the most common being in a status effect called Frightened, which forced your opponents to move and not end their turns next to you. Now, you weren't forced not to, but if they chose to end in melee, they took damage. Now, the big thing about Jack seemed to be about moving status tokens from one character to their allies. And that seemed like a cool idea, but I just couldn't get it to work. I just, it, maybe it was the characters I had it with, whatever was going on, it just, I couldn't use that power. And that was their talent that you should be able to use multiple times. And when you leveled them up, it just made that better. But in the entire game, I didn't even move a single token. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, that's one of the things that we, we get when we just kind of blindly uh, draft. Now, I had Elsa, who had some fantastic movement abilities. And interestingly, though she is a magical character, her hatred of her magical abilities, uh, you know, canonically, allowed you to search your deck for non-magic cards. Mm -hmm. Um, she was a real hit and move player uh, with an ability to tank that I never even actually got onto the table as she, <laughs> one of her skills on the card is an invulnerability of one, which allows you to just shrug off at, a, at any attack uh, once. Now, what I need to try at some point is I still think Elsa would combo well with Fusilier or Mickey who search your deck for magic cards. And I'm thinking you might be able to cycle through your deck really neat between the two of them where you're looking for one type or the other, or you use one, see what the card is, and then use the other to grab it. Very I fair. think that'd be a neat combo to try. But we also did notice one thing this this time uh, as we were sort of playing with the effect, because we, we generally had a few effects in play. And one of the things from the mobile game is effects are uh, the effects on your character are uh, dealt with at the end of your turn. Mm -hmm. So you make your turn and then you resolve any any effects that are stacked on your character. Well, as in the board game, it's the first step. The first yeah. thing you do is resolve. Uh, and so they've actually had to go in and double up the number of effects that they're putting on players just in order for them to have any effect at all. Uh, and we discovered that little sort of strange yeah. thing as we were trying to figure out, well, I put this effect on you twice, but you're only getting affected by it once. And it turns out that's actually the point. Uh, they always put the effect on you twice or you'd never be affected by mm -hmm. it at all. Yeah, that's a weird timing thing. It's like they made a decision and it worked for the first. Well, that would have been in the thrills and chills. It worked for the main game in the second first expansion. No problem at all. It's all logical. But then when they wanted to put a fear effect in, because it's not a triggered effect, it's an ongoing effect. You don't just need it there at the start of your turn. You need it there for an entire rotation. So they give you two tokens. So the first time when you activate you take a token off, but then it stays. It, it was kind of weird. Yeah. Now, after Disney, we started a new game of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. Now, this was Deanna's first time playing, but the second game for Sean, or fourth game for Sean, based on previous plays, because fourth hunt for Sean, I think, yep. and I, due to a previous hunt we had with Tori and Kat. Um, the thing with this game is one game is five encounters, five hunts and takes a long time to get through. Um, each hunt is one to two hours. Now, Friday night, we did the first two encounters of a hunt. And I got to say, my big shock was we had to convince Deanna to play. We actually had to talk her into it. She was over on the couch. I'm like, come on, you got to come over. You got to play. I think you'll like it. Wow. Like by the end of those two plays, she was like Googling expansions and going, I need more. Where are more customization? Where are more things I can buy in the deck? Where can I get more Horizon Zero Dawn? And that shocked me. Yeah, now, Mo and Deanna both knew all about Horizon Zero Dawn, but I've never owned a PlayStation of any sort. And so other than hearing other people talk about it and seeing cosplays of it, it's not a property I actually know anything about. So I've been coming at the game from a very different point of view than Mo and D. That said, if you want hours and hours of random Amerithrash, semi-co-op, just killing monsters with a bit of tactics, it's a pretty solid offering for that. Yeah. That was it for Friday night. So the next morning, we got up uh, fairly early for us, <laughs> set some alarms, managed to head out of town to Kingsville by 10 a.m. Uh, first stop there was Miller's Bakery, where Deanna and I grabbed some treats which I got to say, if you're a local and haven't been to Miller's Bakery, you got to go. Some of the best baked goods I've ever had. Strongly recommend their savory croissant. The, the ham and cheese croissant is one of the best things out there. 
And Deanna tried a spinach and ricotta one and liked that even more than the ham and cheese. I preferred the ham and cheese. Um, the whole thing with this place is only open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and they're only open till they sell out. So it's one of those things that if we are going out to Kingsville and it's a weekend, we try to get there, stop by and pick up some stuff. And we managed to pick up a couple boxes, stuff to eat the next morning and stuff to kind of give us some treats throughout the week. I'm not really the treat store, but I definitely agree that the stuff looked phenomenal. There wasn't a single thing out on display that wouldn't have been yummy. Yeah. Oh, just fantastic. stuff. I, I just wish you had tried at least a croissant. Like, I don't like sweet. And I'm like, oh, but it's savory. That's what it, we that's actually Deanna's favorite part is they do a lot of savory dishes and not just sweet treats. From there, we uh, walked over to Joe Hot and Cold. This is a new coffee bar uh, that replaced the Grove Brewery, which moved down to the street to an awesome new place. So it, it replaced that. And it's I, I don't know, it's it's. Kind of a high-end coffee shop hangout place and, and like people sit upstairs and order their food from apps and then go downstairs to grab it and don't interact with people. And there's a lot of group seating on the main floor and then big seating upstairs. And we've been here before and Deanna really liked the coffee. I thought the coffee was okay. And we got some really good breakfast sandwiches um, our last time in Kingsville. But unfortunately, this time they weren't up to par. I, I This was the worst meal of the trip. I actually felt bad for bringing Sean there. And I'm just wondering, because they any other time we've been there, we've had a hard time finding somewhere to sit. That was not a problem this time. So I hope this isn't a sign that they're just sliding downhill and losing popularity. Yeah, I mean, they felt kind of pretentious. And aside from the coffee, which I think Jeff would have approved of, mm -hmm. uh, really nothing to write home about. Uh, both D and I had, uh, you know, notably cold portions of our sandwiches so oh, that was mine too i just yeah. had, there was no point in complaining after you two complained <laughs> yeah definitely cold i and I, I last time was a problem i think they made the sandwiches fresh because i remember waiting longer and i think they've switched their breakfast sandwich to we make them in the morning and we heat them up for people or something because yeah it, well it was not good so so sad news about joe hot and fresh from there we walked down the street because downtown kingsville is not a big place Lots of really cool places in a tight knit little spot to the Red Lantern Coffee Roasters. Because as everyone knows, who's been a fan of the show for very long, knows we are all about our coffee and probably drink far too much of it. Though I'm out right now and I could probably use some more. Um, so we walked down the street to this place. This used to be Merley's. Merley's was one of the most amazing things in Kingsville. I'm still sad they're gone. But Red Lantern's becoming a new favorite. Um, this is it's a coffee shop where they roast their own coffee and they have their own blends. And they serve, you know, snacks. It's a coffee shop. You, you get It's a cafe. You get what you want. What I dig about this place is just somehow super comfortable. Like, just you feel at home there. I don't. I, there's just something comfortable about it. Maybe because I spent my teen years in coffee shops. Um, plus, it's also very gamer friendly. Actually, when we walked in, there was a couple in a corner playing Disney Villainous against each other. So that was pretty cool. Plus, they have some nice big tables that don't have a ton of chairs. So they only have four chairs. So I don't feel like I'm taking up someone else's spot. And I just, I dig that place a lot. And thankfully, when we got there, they were not as crowded as when we first drove past them, where yes. we had looked in and seen that they were packed, possibly standing room only. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, a cool, chill vibe there. Uh, they had a great little uh, sort of tart-sized quiche to make up for the uh, the sandwich at Joe's that hadn't, <laughs> uh, hadn't done it. And uh, yeah, no, it was just a nice, quiet place to to play games and uh, enjoy. Uh, to be honest, the coffee was a little wasn't as fancy as at Joe's. Yep. I, it was it's more of a generic, not generic, but you know, simple coffee. Whereas there was definitely more notes of flavoring when at that Joe's coffee. But it's a perfectly good cup of Joe. And to be honest, I prefer Red Lanterns, but I don't like dark roast. Right, it's more of a medium lighter roast, and and again, more generic. My favorite coffee is still a, a donut shop coffee, donut house. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I prefer that coffee to Joe's, and I knew that. Um, and yeah, they have good treats. I got a a cheddar bacon scone because again, breakfast was was a little lacking. <laughs> so, and then as the day went on, we got multiple cups. I don't know, just friendly place. The the owners are friendly. It was it, we happened to get there as they were emptying out, and it was funny because another wave showed up as they were closing. And I got to give the place props. To their closing in five minutes, they let two groups come in, order coffee for there, and let them stay. Like, we left, and they were still there. So I always appreciate when a place 
isn't silly about their hours and isn't like, oh, no, sorry, we're closing in 15 minutes. You can't have a coffee. And that happened to us last time we were there. Now we this time just managed to wrap up our game, which gets to the game we played. So the first game of the day was Castellans of Valeria, which some of you may be going, whoa, whoa, what's this? I've never heard of this one. That's because it's not out yet. We actually have a prototype copy of the game. This is going to be the latest Valeria game that is launching on Kickstarter in June. I think June 6th is the day, but don't quote me on that. I'm sure we'll be talking about it as we get closer to the Kickstarter. Now, this is a strange kind of game because it's an area majority game. Reminds me quite a bit of El Grande. It's almost like a folk on a map game, except your folk are buildings. You're not placing armies out. You're placing various buildings into districts. Now, when I we first saw this and when we agreed to review it, we thought this was a dice placement game where you were going to take dice, put them on spots to activate things. And that's not really what it is. Instead, it's dice drafting where you are drafting different dice and they're going to give you resources. And then you have a bunch of different options to take and then you spend a die to take it. So it's almost like like Race for the Galaxy or San Juan or Puerto Rico where you're picking an action to do and you get a bonus if you use the right die, which I found really neat. Now, those actions include building manors, putting them out, hiring citizens, going to the wharf to buy and sell goods, um, building giant artifacts that score, and basically building up these different districts, and then scoring points for basically uh, everything you build is worth one point, and whoever has the most po- most things built gets victory points. Yeah, there's a lot going on, and you really need to focus as the board gets busier and busier and busier. Uh, the scoring round, in fact, is quite difficult because there's all there's so much in each section that that mm-hmm. just double, making sure that you have counted everything properly and and assigned the correct victory points can be tough because it's yeah. easy to miss things with all these cute little uh, meeple buildings out there. That being said, there's a lot to this game and it definitely had a bit of the Valeria feel to it. Now, part of that, of course, is the fact you have the Miko's artwork combined with the four guilds you're used to having in the Valeria. And I never remember what they are. I always call it priests, thieves, fighters, and and, and blacksmiths. But I know those aren't right. So, yeah, just it, it, it did. It had that Valeria feel. The citizens. Any game where you buy citizens that give you powers, that's a very Valeria thing to me. Um, what I was really impressed by is this is a prototype. But the two layered player boards are honestly the best I've ever played with. There, there's no warping. They're they're nice and detailed. They're clear to read. It's very obvious that when I uncover this, I get this. I was really impressed by those boards. Yeah, no, they were fantastic. Uh, now we don't the 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 building meeple don't fit it properly, but we knew that no. going in. That was that was given to us up front. Uh, but even even allowing for that, they were still perfectly fine. Yeah. There was nothing wrong with them. Uh, one of the things that we definitely did in this game, I think, was underused the citizens. So as yeah. well as building buildings, there are citizen cards that you can collect that allow you to modify dice or or have other special things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and reading through the booklet that we had kind of ignored during the game, turns out there are some powerful combos that we probably yeah. could have taken advantage of. Yeah, I got to say the amount of wood in this is impressive. Um Slightly concerned it's going to lead to a high player count or sorry, cost of the game component cost. But we'll see uh, when that comes out, because right now we don't we don't have a price point for this. But what was nice is not only are there a ton of different sort of like meeples for your generic building. You got a meeple for your lighthouse. You got a meeple for your boats. You got a meeple for each of your citizens. Those are all the same. So meeple for citizens. Um, There's a windmills. There's three artifacts. And I'm probably missing at least one other building type that you can build. And they're all silk screened with like bits of black features on them to make them look like what they're supposed to be. Even even the cubes are cargo cubes yes. that are painted the silk screen to look like like crates. Yes. And then the wooden resources were all actual um, textured. So like the wood had grain on it. The the stone had little like chips in it and stuff like that, which is, is going to be fantastic for people with um, vision issues because absolutely every piece is uniquely shaped, which is great to see. And I got to say, having all these on the map just looks cool. You end up with you kind of end up with like a 3D village map with like the the landmarks all sticking out everywhere. Like I almost thinking this would be cool for a D&D game. Let's take a picture of the end, end of uh, your game of Castellans of Valeria and be like, here you go. And then, you know, just add a legend pointing to each of the buildings. There you go. 
Now, at this point, this was only our first play. Um, I will say the big thing is it looks intimidating, but by the third turn, maybe, like if we had it down, and by the end, it was flowing very quickly. Like our, our last turns were definitely quicker than our first. Though scoring, of course, took longer because there was more things to count. And Sean mentioned that scoring is complicated, but it isn't in a way because literally you just count everything. Like everything's worth one except the windmill, which goes between and it worth, yeah, worth no, half. The, the complicated part was making sure you saw and counted everything yes. properly. Uh, the big thing being the green actually counting as buildings, which we mi yeah. mixed messed up on possibly once or twice. But yeah, finding majority is generally easy. Whoever has the most pieces has majority, mm -hmm. which is, is nice compared to, well, citizens are worth one and buildings are worth two and wharfs are worth three. Like you didn't have any of that. So that was cool. Ah, uh, there were, there was, the, there were half points in there, which is the one. Yeah, I said the windmills exception. with yeah. the half points. <laughs> windmills go between and count half in each territory, which was a little different. So I, I was impressed. Like, like it's not actually that heavy. Now there are tons of icons. Like I'm talking race for the galaxy level of icons. I would say too many icons and the rules need work, but this is a prototype. Specifically, we found out after the fact that we were having a problem deciding cards. They're going to give you a lore book with this, which is kind of cool because I so far dig the Valeria world so far. And they're going to give you this lore book. Well, I didn't realize I have a prototype copy of this, that there's game rules in there. That's where all the what it tells you what each of the districts are and what the city is and what each building type is and what it represents which is cool, but it also tells you not only what all the citizen cards are, but what they do in the game. And it not only tells you like what the wharf is, it gives you tips on how to best use the wharf action. And I, I actually complained to the company saying like, this doesn't make sense. Why would you have a lore book and put game rules in it? Put the game rules in the game rule book. And I've already heard back and they're saying, yeah, we're going to put those in the core rule book. Now, I don't know if it's going to be as well or if they'll be separate. So I'm um, not that I appreciate doing free play testing for people, but it was cool to, that they're actually listening. And I have a feeling it's not going to be a problem when the final game comes out. Absolutely. And I mean, this is, this is not, uh, you know, some fly by night company or some, no. some homebrew uh, provider for, you know, they've, they've got a history of making good games. And uh, I think they, they show that they do listen to people. Uh, next we headed back across. I keep saying across the street, technically it's two streets. Wait, we're crossing two streets. There's a, there's there's the crossroads basically in Kings, and everything's right there. We crossed the street diagonally this time and headed over to the Bandit Goose Brewery. Um, Bandit Goose Brewery is our favorite brewery in Windsor Essex area. I love their beers. They they are adventurous, but not too much so. Like things don't get weird, which I dig. Not not super hipster, just creative. Yeah, uh, and, and a wide variety, which is a huge bonus when we're bringing people there that may not have the same beer taste as us. Now, I did try a new beer of theirs, Rock the Bach, which was quite good. Um, Deanna was a little bummed because one of the reasons we actually did this this weekend is they have a seasonal pawpaw beer. Now, pawpaw is a fruit that's native to the area that was thought to be extinct and a local farm is bringing it back. And every year they do a collaboration with Bandit Goose and produce a pawpaw sour. Sadly, they didn't have that on tap but they did have cans so deanna was able to pick up some cans of that and uh sean even got a beer trying their lemon sour and honestly i loved it uh i enjoy sour candies like the warheads and such uh and this was a really smooth refreshing beer with that tart sort of lemony bite on the tongue afterwards that was really refreshing and uh was a great uh a great drink to sit and uh enjoy a game with now, next, uh, we didn't go for any food because we had just eaten breakfast plus breakfast times two kind of thing there. Um, so we got a table in the back. They have a heated patio that's pretty nice. They have this big uh, harvest table. We sat at that. And yes, I know it's a game about wine, and we probably should have like went down the street again, down the street, to, to, to um, one of the local wineries because we live in the wine region of Ontario. But no, we were at a brewery instead because I prefer beer. And we broke out Viticulture. Now, this is the original Viticulture. This is technically it's the second printing, which does add the Grande Worker. But this is not the essential edition. We didn't have anything from Tuscany, just the base Viticulture game that I bought when it came out. This, I was shocked by how good it still is. Like, I, not that I thought, but like some games don't age well. And back when I got this, I rated it a 10. I would probably still, I might have dropped it to a nine now, mainly for something we'll talk about later. But I still enjoyed this game a lot. And it's one of those, I'm like, I, I have too many games because we should be playing that more often. 
Yeah, my first time playing, but uh, this game is really well designed. It's just not hard to grasp despite being a weightier game. Uh, mm -hmm. Knowing the general makeup of the decks will help you, but it's not mandatory. You can still have a solid game uh, just sitting down blindly with a, with a good teach. Yeah, it's, it was extremely enjoyable. I, I was glad we played it. I, I, I kind of wish we had had a second one, but then I would have been tempted by another round of beers, and that's not a good idea when I am driving everyone around. Um, so then we headed back to Windsor. Um, then we had a meal that totally made up for the failed breakfast and brunch at Georgia Ray's Hot Chicken. Now, this is a well-known uh, Tecumseh restaurant. Just I, I you know people hate it if I call it a suburb of Windsor. <laughs> Nearby town connected to Windsor. Um, with a place and it's owned by a couple who are known for opening restaurants. That's just what they do. They open restaurants. They're always good. They, I don't know if they make the menu or they hire fantastic cooks. I'm not sure the details there, but then they get bored. They're like, okay, we've done it. We, we, we had our, they, they had a place called Sweetie's Southern Chicken, which did, I don't know the other type of Southern chicken. This is Nashville hot chicken. So they did sweet teas and they're like, yeah, okay, let's close this. Let's do a burger place. And they made Mammo Burger Bar, which is fantastic. There's still a second location that's still open, but they're like, eh, we're sick of that. And they opened a place called Fig and Berries. That place was French um, haute couture cuisine. And I'll admit I never went there. It's not my kind of food. So then they then they put that up for sale and opened uh, Georgia Ray's. Well, now they're sick of it. So Georgia Ray's is up for sale. Um, the thing is, they're really hoping someone will buy it the way Mammo was bought and keep everything, keep the menu, keep the chef, keep it going, and they're going to move on to their next thing. So good luck to them, because so far, they're, they're, they're bat for me, they're batting 4 to 5. One place wasn't really my style, but whatever. So I wanted to try it before it potentially closed, plus see what all the hype's been. It just never made it out, right? Not enough time. Wait was long, like ex exceedingly long, but then the food made up for it. If the food hadn't been as good, I might have complained. Um, I personally did chicken and waffles. Deanna got their hot chicken sandwich, which is what they're famous for, and Sean got something of his own. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I didn't find the wait all that long myself, but yeah. uh, possibly just because we were chatting nicely. Uh, I had the pulled pork sandwich uh, alongside a deep-fried mac and cheese. Uh, damn fine southern cooking. I, you mm. know, the mac and cheese was amazing. The sand, you know, the, the pulled pork sandwich with the coleslaw on top. Uh, just really good southern food like yeah <laughs> you just can't go wrong yeah best cornbread i've ever had there, that cornbread was amazing yeah i wished i'd tried uh another side as well as the the mac and cheese because i would have liked to have to tried their their they've got the pit beans and stuff mm -hmm. so yeah d tried the collard greens thought they were fantastic yeah really impressed i uh, hope to make it back and hopefully someone buys them and keeps them going Back to the house, we returned to Horizon Zero Dawn. We had left it set up. Blew through a hunt. And it felt good. Like, like it was finally, it didn't take two hours to play through. Everything was starting to fall into place. A lot less rule book referencing. A lot less looking things up. Actually remembering that when you defend, you have to dodge and move. Um, things went much better. Yeah, character choice matters in this game, unfortunately. But then again, so does luck. Uh, you just kind of have to go with it. If you're playing a four player game, every character is in play. So character choice isn't as much of a matter, but because mm -hmm. we were only playing three, it turns out we probably should have spent a little more time looking at the characters before we picked. Yeah. Plus there's a whole thing where, where each character has their own weapon. And when the merchants only have stuff for sale for the character, that's not in the game, that gets a little annoying. Now, after this, Deanna's eyes were bugging her. No, she's not fully healed from her surgery. Uh, so Sean and I took advantage of that fact. In addition to the big table in the game room, we have a dining room upstairs that has a table. So we moved upstairs for a bit and we played more Disney. Uh, this time we just put everything on the table and did the full drafting thing. I ended up drafting Jack, Buzz Lightyear, and Fusilier. And I grabbed uh, Moana, Demona, and Elsa. I, I gotta say my combo kind of worked. It, it, I, I enjoyed Buzz. I had see Sean play Buzz earlier the, the, or the day before, and I'm like, no, Buzz Lightyear's neat. I really do dig the the multi range. I especially like his hit someone one square away, two square away, three, and then his power that as long as he stays exactly two squares away from someone, he can damage them again. I found that really powerful. 
Um, still couldn't get Jack's move token thing going. I don't know. That, that, that seems like a, a more difficult character to learn how to use well. I didn't really get that going. I just, I, and I couldn't get carrot status tokens to stick on the team Sean played, which some of that has to do with the characters. And Fusilier was a lot of fun. I hadn't actually personally played Fusilier, having only played against him. And holy cow, status effects and making your opponent discard cards, he can be pretty nasty. Yeah. Well, I was trying to combo Moana and Elsa's movements along while, well, while being able to use Demona's range attacks, which is what she's known for. But I just couldn't get a vibe going. And that Jack Fusilier team was mm. really rough on me. So yeah, I think the, that was the most unbalanced game we'd had so far. Yeah, that was the first time where it's been like, you, I can't win. This is we're going to call it here. You, you took it. Yeah, whereas the game before, Sean was like, I'm doomed, I'm done, I'm doomed, I'm yep. done, and I won. win. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of how the game often plays, I yep. find. Yep. Now, after D's nap, she joined us, and we finished off our final hunts in Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, I will say it felt a little easy by the end, and I think a big part of that had to do with what came out at the merchants, who got to buy what. Um, Deanna had armor of ridiculousness. She basically could walk around and taunt all the monsters and stand there and just soak damage and take nothing. Now, personally, I think that was just luck of the draw. And the comboed well with the fact she was getting a lot of bonus scrap for things she was doing. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it was overpowering or not. Uh, one thing to note, this is a competitive game and it's not like she won. So there is that aspect. But I will say, I think she was playing more cooperatively than the game intends. So that might have been part of it. Um, in the end, Deanna was like, no, I would rather play this cooperatively, which I understand. I, competitive games or however people want to call them, competitive game, cooperative games with winners don't always go over well. And this game, I think to be enjoyable is meant to be played competitively. I think you're supposed to steal the kills and you're supposed to do the things. Yeah, it, it's sort of, but not really co-op. I mean, if we hadn't worked together at all, we never would have finished the game. Yeah, there's no way. Uh, there's no way. Uh, but then again, the end fight was a bit of a letdown because we were just overmatched. I mean, between D's armor, D, D was able to soak melee. I was able to soak ranged. And, you know, I had I to, just I, you you, do, you dodged in and, and back out again while yeah. I had a pretty killer ranged attack. I mean, I was able to do like ridiculous amounts of ranged damage. So I just stole kills. That's that's what I did. I, <laughs> I, I was the jerk who, who yeah. went in. You did all the damage. D soaked all the damage. I snuck in, hit a guy, cut the credit and rolled out. Yeah. Now, I will admit there was one move in the end game where my character was unconscious. And then I played this sneak attack thing where I played dead. That that was pretty awesome. <laughs> Actually, that 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 I don't know was fitting to the theme of the game. Now, we are going to be record, re, uh, reviewing this one later in our review segment. So for those of you listening at home or watching live, stick around for that. Uh, for those of you watching this segment on YouTube, jump over to our review when you're done here to find out more about Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, we finished up Saturday with a couple of beers and Castle Panic. Again, we've got a copy, uh, thanks to Fireside Games, of the new big box for the second edition. At this point, Sean had never played, so and I don't think he ever watched like Will Wheaton play on tabletop, so didn't have a lot of knowledge of the game, if any. So we played the base game again and lost terribly. Like I was there 15 tokens left in the bag, I think, plus Something everything like was out. Yeah, like I, I don't get it. Like, why why is this game supposed so hard for us? Everyone else seems to think it's easy. I I I was on the on my phone and Googling and you know. Do we're doing something wrong and people are like oh this game is just too easy you need the expansions to make it difficult we've played 20 times and never lost like what and we got crushed i mean it, yeah. there was just no hope of us None. even considering winning we probably could have you know quit 10 minutes or 20 minutes sooner <laughs> and had the same because it was just there was no way we were going to win yeah, we can't figure if people are house ruling it, if people are misunderstanding a rule. Do the dice hate us? Are I, we somehow cheating against ourselves? I don't know. If, I, if you're a castle panic expert, please yeah. let us know in the comments and 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 t ask us if we've been doing something that you know that people do wrong. Because yes, 
it's yeah now i will say there is a thread on reddit where people are talking about when you use an archer you hit everything in the arc that's wrong we double check that so that might be why people are winning 20 times without losing is because they're attacking every monster in an arc with one card which is not right we have confirmed that we double checked it because i'm like wow that would make things easier and yeah i'm kind of tempted to play that way to see if we win but that is not by the rule you only get to hit one monster per card um except as like boulders and stuff but like your generic you know your swordsman doesn't hit everything in the blue arc <laughs> yeah so that was the only thing we could find online is it seemed like a lot of people were playing that wrong somehow but even with that i mean even in threads where people weren't discussing incorrect rules like that they all seemed to think it was too easy yeah and i i don't get that maybe it's terrible luck i i have no idea so anyway castle panic the the hardest co-op i've ever played so far it seems like we're gonna have to grab ghost stories for an easy experience after this so that was it for saturday night the next morning we got out we handed out for brunch to after getting a bit of work done i uh, went to a place uh nice and close to me called edda's greeklish eatery this is a place that's been around for a while it replaced the honey badger bistro loved it when it opened um it was a greek couple that owned it serving what they call greeklish food and it was like greek fusion with local canadian food and some pierogies and stuff in there too kind of kind of a weird mix of food i dig it like greeklish that's a neat term we love the place but then i think it was during covid they ended up selling the place to buy out a local shoe store so whatever owners want to run a shoe store it's actually a fantastic shoe store if you have kids in windsor essex go to karen's for kids to get your shoes <laughs> uh no this is not a sponsored post <laughs> um so when they sold it they sold it to some new owners and I was concerned that, that there's no way that Edda's could be as good as it was. So this was our first time actually going back. And I've got to say, food-wise, it was as good as ever. Yeah, it this, was. Yeah, this is definitely a new morning breakfast joint worth remembering. Uh, you know, every part of the food and the service and, you know, the friendly, the friendly people coming out and making sure everything's great. It mm -hmm. was it was just a really uh, great restaurant and a nice way to make up for the one that we no longer go to because of <laughs> their chosen politics. Well, yes, there is that, too. Uh, yeah, at any time the, the you know, chef comes out to make sure everything's all good and is friendly about it, that, that's always good to see. So, yeah, big fan of Edda's. If you stopped going like us because it got new owners, don't, don't be concerned. Go check it out. I do worry they're doing badly because they have, like, a handwritten sign in the window that says all day breakfast which to me is kind of a, a cry for help. Like, hey, come eat here. Go back. Go eat there. It's it's great food. I will admit, not cheap. It's not, you know, cheap breakfast. It's it, But it's good, hearty breakfast. Um, they, they, Some of the best eggs Benedict I've ever had. And I got to say, I love the skillets. And Deanna's favorite is that you can get potato pancakes with things instead of hash browns. Like like Greek, I, I don't remember, maslaka or something. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. But the, the Greek potato pancakes instead of your usual potato is the big draw for Deanna. Uh, mostly we talk shop. Like uh, that was a, a big part of our Sunday was sitting and enjoying some coffee. There are some things we're trying different. Um, we're testing a couple things in regards to podcast downloads. Um, nothing big that people have to worry about, like no big changes coming to the show or anything like that. Um, uh, the biggest change might be if Sean actually does change what we are looking at right now and how our windows are displayed and in, in our look for our podcast. But like just talking about generic things, uh, how what we're going to review next, what we're going to do over our reviews. Um, you may see less unboxings in the future, but that's about it. Nothing, nothing major, but enough stuff, stuff we need to talk about. Badly or perhaps not, reviewing games is just not all fun and games, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it's one of your primary sources of income. Yep. Uh, sadly, you can't pay your tax bill with a box full of meeple. Anyone want used review copies? I, I can't send those to the, the the Canadian Revenue Agency, unfortunately. So next, we got back to the house, and it was time to keep working towards one of my goals for the weekend. So we upgraded my copy of Viticulture to the Essential Edition. Now, this didn't mean going and buying the Essential Edition. That's what I was trying to avoid doing. Because it ends up the Essential Edition is the original second edition of Viticulture, with the Tuscany expansion mixed and matched. So some of the stuff from Tuscany is added. And I have both expansions. I sadly hadn't really dove, I've dove in, gotten into Tuscany much. We'd only unlocked a few things in there. 
And a lot of what we had to add, I hadn't even unlocked yet or seen. So it was a matter of opening packages and stuff. And I got to say, like, I get it. Stonemaier wants you to just go buy the Essential Edition. And for anyone nowadays, if you buy the game, you're not going to have this problem because you buy the Essential Edition. But it was a bit annoying to, to update. More annoying than I thought. Yeah, better instructions on how to upgrade could have made this so much easier. Because it wasn't yeah. a hard process. It was the instructions that made it tedious. Yeah, the biggest problem was adding in the new visitor cards. All they had to say was add in all the new visitor new visitor cards from Tuscany, add the ones from uh, one other part of Tuscany. I can't remember what it was called, a knowledgeist or Arborist. something. Arborist, there you go. Yeah, add in all the new visitors from the Arborist and the new visitor cards. That's all they had to say. Instead, they sent a spreadsheet, and it was alphabetical. And we looked at the list that said essential. We looked at the list, and we went through card by card. I gave my phone to Deanna, blew it up nice and big, and she just read off each one. And like, I had the stack of new cards. Sean had the stack of old cards. We went through it all, and in the end, we just used all of them. And I'm like, all you had to tell me was add all the new visitors from Tuscany, add in all the ones from the Arbor, and done. We yeah. would have been done in <laughs> ten minutes. You know, two instead, sen two sentences instead of instead of spreadsheets. Yeah, uh, talk I'd, about I'd, making things way more difficult. I mean, maybe if there was something different in first edition, but I still no. That, that was, was another column on the spreadsheet. Oh. So if we had first edition, it would have been it would have been different. So yeah, I, a little unimpressed by that. So like I said not a problem for the average person. Your average person go you just go buy viticulture, you get the essential. This is done for you. Um, that played. We played it right. We did the upgrade. I want to see what how's essential compared to the original and oh my gosh it's it's there's a reason he put it out as the essential edition the i i already loved the game but this was better um biggest thing was more money at the start of the game another thing i loved asymmetric abilities you combine a mama and a papa card or now they're called blue and red sorry in my edition they're called mama and papa cards add a blue and red card and gives you different stuff than everyone else and it's going to be random because those decks were significant uh, the, the odds, I don't even think you could have two players with the actual start. Um, that gave you some starting resources or cards or vines. And honestly, it felt like the same feel we had for using Prelude with Terraforming Mars. It, it gives you a resource boost. It gets the game going and it gives you a bit of direction. Like if you start with a, you know, whatever, a four red wine in your hand, you're like, OK, I should try to focus on reds because that's what I start with. And step one is going to be to build the trellis to plant this. And now I know what I'm going to do. Because I will say the day before we played Viticulture and I complained a bit that at the beginning, it just it's, it's a slow build. Like you, you don't have any vines yet. And you're also scripted because every player starts with a Pinot wine that requires a vine or a, a trellis. And it's like every player that turn one or two has got to build a trellis. So they need the money to build the trellis and it felt kind of scripted. That was all fixed in the Essential Edition. Yeah. Now, as usual, I did much better the first time that before with the, the, uh, than with the Essential Edition. But that's actually how almost all games go for me yes. every time. I just do better on my first ga uh, game when I can't possibly overthink them. Yes. <laughs> uh, so no surprises there. But it was no, no, it was absolutely solid. And the red and the blue cards do make for such a better yeah. flow to that game. You don't sort of feel like you're not doing anything for an entire mm -hmm. year uh yeah. just sort of waiting for that second year to come around so you can do things this way you've got that start in that first year you are hitting yep. the ground running you know you got a little bit of mom of money for mom and dad to start your vineyard rather than you know being out there in the fields digging with your hands yes plus there's other additional rules there like the ability to sell your fields i can't think of a game we played since where someone didn't sell a field for that extra money at the beginning. So I got to say that was cool. Now, the reason all this Viticulture play happened is I have been sitting on a copy of Viticulture World for way too long at this point. So my games we usually hammer through. And one of the biggest problems is you won't send me anything new until I review this. No, <laughs> that is part of it. Um, so I've been looking forward to trying now. What this is, is this is the cooperative expansion for Viticulture, which, of course, makes it cooperative that's that's what it does but i gotta say it is quite different from viticulture while still being viticulture we played green gully so what this gives you is a bunch of different regions of the world that you can go try to make wine in and in this particular 
case. It's like the easy intro, get to learn the game expansion, which again goes to our topic of onboarding, which comes up now and then of good onboarding. Like it did a really good job of making sure you tried the new things and see the things you have to do. And I also got to say, I, I, I liked the Charterstone tie in for people who played Charterstone. That's a cute Easter egg. Uh, and the fantastic thing is your meeple get hats. This is fantastic. You get summer and winter hats. You're you no longer have uh, a or you're no longer, you know, adding meeple in throughout the game by buying them. You have meeple at the start, but mm -hmm. until they lose their hats, they are only temporary workers and not fully available to use all of the benefits of the game. And they are the yep. rubber hats that fit right on your meeple uh, and are really sort of cute and adorable. Yep. Now, uh, I did like that. Yep. Good. Good. Depending on uh, on how well you know Viticulture, um, the intro, which again is, is a fantastic onboarding, but if you are familiar with Viticulture, at first especially, it feels a little bit too handholdy. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, but it does turn out that at the end, it's actually important <laughs> that it's been holding your hand and, and ushering you along because it was a nail biter and they expected it to be, yep. it was very clear that they knew you were going to be desperately trying to figure out how to get the last couple of points, dollars, fame, etc., in order to crawl all past that goal before the end of the game. Now, the big surprise for me here, um, I guess I just don't pay enough attention to stuff because I get surprised by games too often. This was not the legacy expansion I thought it was. Now, I will say, I don't think I ever saw Jamie or Stonemeyer calling this a legacy expansion, but I definitely saw uh, other people, other gamers saying this is the, the legacy expansion. Oh, it's a legacy version. This is not a legacy game in, in any way whatsoever. And honestly, I feel bad we hadn't gotten to this game sooner. But I thought this, even if it wasn't right on cards, destroy things, needed a said steady group, that there was some form of campaign here. But it's not. This isn't even a campaign game. This is each region you visit is a standalone game. And the permanent improvements you make are for that game in that region. Once you play another region, your board wipes like you're using the same board. So really, this is a scenario based co-op game not a legacy game or a campaign game at all. Yeah, absolutely. And this is uh, annoying because it could have gotten to the table so much sooner because yeah. there wasn't any concern for needing that stable weekly group that we were going to be able to get to week in and week out over and over again. Uh, turns out that was completely unnecessary. Yeah. And like I said, I'm not sure where the miscommunication was, where I, where I got the impression I did have on this. So we could have dived into this one way sooner. Plus, I'm not going to worry about spoilers. This yeah. isn't a legacy game where you're unlocking anything. No, now, absolutely. I will admit, I don't know if I want to talk about um, each event that happens in each of the regions. I think people are going to want to discover those. But I think those would still be kind of spoilers. But again, it's spoiling a story game in a way more than spoiling like nothing mechanical. I'm not giving you clues. Nothing's going to make it easier for you. It just I, you might want to be surprised by some of the things that are going to happen. Um, I'm only calling them permanent upgrades because that's what they call them in the book. They call them you want to do permanent upgrades and they're permanent in the fact that they're there for the rest of that game. But yes, when you start a new game or you switch to a new scenario, that's all wiped and you got to start over. And it's not even like each region has new improvements. Well, who knows? Maybe they'll have something in there, but there's no more tokens left. So, you know, looking ahead. It sure seems like it's the same. And I got to say, I was impressed. Like, it, it was fun. It was, it was quite the puzzle. Um, there, I, I, what it surprised me is it seemed like there was very little quarterbacking where there could have been. Like, there was just something about it where you all kind of seemed to be doing our own thing mainly. Like, we'd, we'd, we'd be like, you got to do this and this, but the rest of your turn, you know, do yeah, whatever. Absolutely. I mean, you, there's a lot of different ways to improve your vineyard. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of options and you're all aiming for the same goal. But just like in a normal game of viticulture, there are different paths to get to that goal, depending yeah. on what vines you have, what, uh, you know, what orders you have, what uh, what visitors might have dropped by. 
it's there's a lot to it and so i'm until you get you're getting towards that end and you're like oh okay look you need to get some more yeah. you uh, need to get some more victory points like, like there's no reason not to say it. you need to have a set amount of influence and you need to each player has to hit 25 points and if anyone's played the original viticulture 25 used to be the max you could get and there are not many games none of the games we played before this did anyone get to 25 I don't think that's a that's a spoiler for anything. So I got to say, I was impressed. I'm just a little frustrated because like there is no reason we couldn't have broke this out at any time. There's no reason I can't bring it to the barbershop bar our next event and play it with a brand new group that's never played Viticulture before. So I think they'll have a hard time if you've never played <laughs> Viticulture. Yeah, but I will just to, to comment on the it feeling tense. There was a point where I was like, do we just suck at Viticulture? Like, like, like. Like, we're not going to make this. There is no way we're going to like, like, yeah, we all played against each other, but maybe we all sucked equally. So our viticulture games were close because I got to say that first game we played at um, Bandit Goose, I think we were all within one point of each other at the end. Yeah, I think it was 23, 22, 21. Yeah, which is really cool. So that was it. That was the last game we played. Um, not a huge number of games, but you have to realize that those Horizon Zero Dawn probably totaled 10 hours. If you include setup, takedown, sorting cards, and all the extra stuff, and teaching the rules to Deanna, I would say we spent 10 hours this weekend playing that. So that is, that is an epic game that I'm glad we didn't try to squeeze in all into one game night. Yeah. Overall, though, Sean Khan had great food, great homes, games, and I went home feeling like we had accomplished a huge yes. amount, both in play and you know business discussions about the uh, the channel. Yeah, it was great. I, I honestly think we need to do this more often because um, it got us to actually buckle down, get in a bunch of games. Uh, it was great for the pile of obligation and, saint, and shame. The, the, like the Viticulture, I hadn't touched my Viticulture copy in forever. I finally got to try with the Essentials. We got a brand new game off the pile of shame and obligation. We got in more plays of the Disney expansion so we can talk about them more intelligently with more opinions on them. Sean got to try Castle Panic for the first time. Like, that's a lot for one weekend. And I would love to do these a little more often. Like, I don't know, every other month or whatever, but I'd like to at least, like we called this one spring. So if we can at least do a summer, fall, and winter, I'll be happy. Maybe we can squeeze in a bit more. But that is going to be all for now. Yes. Now we're normally here to answer your gaming game night questions. You can get questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com, clicking on Ask the Bellhop, or send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 